sound your vascular system is composed of three components, the heart, blood vessels and the blood. The heart is basically a cone-shaped muscular pump. Vessels are an intrinsic network of tubes that carry blood. This is a liquid connective tissue consisting of plasma and cellular components. The anatomy of the heart can be very confusing. The heart is composed of many different components. All of these components are critical for you to know so that you understand how the heart works. The heart is cone-shaped with a broad base at the top from which the large blood vessels enter and exit. The tip known as the apex points downwards and lies close to the sternum. In the horse, the apex is blunted during diastole the longitudinal axis of the heart is tilted, resulting in the base facing cranodorsally and the apex chordoventrally. The ceaseless beating of the heart in the thorax has intrigued people for thousands of years. The ancient Greeks thought the heart was the seat of intelligence, others the source of emotions. Although these theories have proved false, emotions certainly affect the heart rate. Only when your heart pounds or occasionally skips a beat do you become aware of this dynamic organ. Here is the location of the heart within the thorax. This is an inferior view of a cross section showing the heart's relative position in the thorax. The heart is located in the thoracic cavity in between the lungs, 60% of it lying to the left of the median plane. Most of the heart's surface is covered by the lungs, and in ju juveniles it is broader cranially by the thalamus. Quarterly the heart extends as far as the diaphragm. The heart makes direct contact with the ribs through the cardiac notches of the lungs to the third and fourth intercostal space on the right. The atria of the heart is separated from the ventricles by the coronary sulcus, also called coronary groove, auriculo-ventricular groove, atrioventricular groove and the AV groove. This contains the trunks of the nutrient vessels of the heart and is deficient in front where it is crossed by the root of the pulmonary trunk. On the posterior surface of the heart the coronary sulcus contains the coronary sinus. Outside of the heart is lined with a thin tissue called the pericardium. Under the pericardium, you have the fibrous pericardium and the serous pericardium. Beneath the serous pericardium is the epicardium. Under the epicardium is a thick muscular layer called the myocardium. Then finally, we reach the thin inner layer of the heart, which is the endocardium. The pericardium is the serous membrane, which is the membrane lining the walls of the body cavities and enclosing the contained organs. It consists of the mesothelium lying upon a connective tissue layer 
and it secretes a watery liquid. It lines the cavity in which the heart sits, called the pericardial cavity. This pericardial membrane forms two layers, visceral, which is epicardium, and the parietal pericardium. The pericardium is the serous membrane lying the cavity in which the heart sits. The pericardial cavity. This pericardial membrane forms two layers, visceral and epicardium, and parietal pericardium. The pericardium is reinforced by a layer called the fibrous pericardium, and together the fibrous and the parietal pericardium constitute the pericardial sac. So we have the heart wall consists of three layers, endocardium, myocardium, pericardium. The heart is one of the most important muscles in the equine's body. Each day, an adult equine heart beats on average 56,000 times and over your lifespan, about 2.5 million times. The fibrous pericardium encases, protects and secures the heart. Inside the pericardium is the heart wall and this is organised into three main layers. The outermost layer of the heart wall is the epicardium, which is also the innermost layer of the pericardium. The middle layer of the heart wall is the myocardium. This is the actual muscular layer of the heart, responsible for contracting and pumping blood through the body. The endocardium is the thin innermost layer of tissue that makes direct contact with the blood pumping through the heart chambers. Now let's explore each layer in more detail. The endocardium is a layer of the pericardium the pericardium is composed of three membrane layers that encircle the exterior of the heart. The outer fibrous pericardium, the middle parietal pericardium and the inner epicardium, also referred to as the visceral pericardium. Together, these layers fused form a space around the heart called the pericardial cavity. When you talk about the heart muscle, you are specifically referring to the myocardium of the heart. This tissue contracts and relaxes to pump blood to your lungs for oxygenation and then sends it to the tissues of the body. The myocardium varies in thickness based on how much force that particular chamber of the heart needs to pump blood to the desired location. Endocardium is a very thin layer of cells that line the interior chambers of your heart. They are the cells that make direct contact with the blood and are responsible for providing a smooth surface for the blood to glide against. Just how cooking spray forms a layer between the cake pan and the dough to keep it from sticking the endocardium creates a silk, silky smooth layer that keeps the cells of your blood from collecting or sticking to the myocardium of the heart. Fibrous skeleton is composed of dense connective tissue, functions to stabilize the position of the muscle layers of the heart and the heart valves. It provides support for the blood vessels and nerves of the myocardium and elasticity to the heart recoils after contraction. 
It also aids in the distribution of the forces of contraction and prevents overexpansion of the heart. The cardiac skeleton separates the chambers of the heart. It provides anchoring points for cardiac muscle fibres and cardiac valves and insulates the electrical impulses of the heart's conduction system. The heart consists of four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. The left and right atria are positioned superior to the coronary sulcus. They both have thin walls and consist of expandable extensions called oracles. The left and right ventricles are positioned inferior to the coronary sulcus and much of the left ventricle forms the diaphragmatic surface. The left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the lungs via the right and left pulmonary veins. Blood passes through the bicuspid valve, left atrioventricular or mitral valve. The left ventricle needs to be able to pump blood throughout the entire systemic circuit, therefore has the thickest wall. The bicuspid or atrioventricular valve has corridae tendinae connecting to the two cusps and two papillary muscles. This ventricle is six to seven times more powerful than the right ventricle. The right atrium receives deoxygenated blood via their superior vena cava inferior vena cava and coronary sinus, entering the posterior side of the right atrium. It contains pectinate muscles and fossa ovalis, the remnant of the foramen ovale. The right ventricle receives deoxygenated blood from the right atrium via the tricuspid valve. Blood leaves the ventricle by passing through the pulmonary valve, leading to the right and left pulmonary arteries via the pulmonary trunk. The tricuspid or right arterioventricular valve is connected to three papillary muscles via chordae tendinae, and it is these that prevent valve inversion when the ventricles contract. The internal surface of the right ventricle consists of trabeculae carnae and a moderator band, a muscular band that extends from the interventricular septum and the ventricular wall, which prevents overexpansion of the thin walled ventricle. The atrioventricular valves include the tricuspid valve, which separates the right atrium from the right ventricle and is composed of anterior, posterior and septal cusps. The bicuspid mitral valve separates the left atrium from the left ventricle and is composed of anterior and posterior cusps. The anterior cusp is immediately to and continuous with the wall of the aorta. The semilunar valves prevent outflow from the ventricles as the chambers fill and backflow of blood into the ventricles after it has been expelled. The pulmonary semilunar valve is located in the pulmonary trunk. This is where it moderates blood flow through the right ventricle outflow channel. 
the cusps are in the anterior right and left positions. The aortic semilunar valve is located within the aorta, immediately adjacent to the mitral valve. This is where it moderates blood flow through the left ventricular outflow channel. Its cusps are in the posterior right and left positions. The coronary arteries arrive from the sinuses above the right and left cusps. This diaphragm excellently details the flow of blood through the heart. The right coronary artery passes between the right auricle and pulmonary trunk. Major branches of the right coronary artery are the atrial branches, right marginal branch, posterior intraventricular branch, and the conducting system branch. The left coronary artery also has major branches, including the circumflex branch and the anterior ventricular branch. The coronary veins drain cardiac venous blood ultimately into the right atrium. There are five main types of blood vessels, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules and veins illustrated in the image below. Each have particular properties that are modifications of a basic design. You can see from this image that arteries have a thick tunica media. In elastic arteries, this has abundant elastic fibers, allowing expansion of the vessel without tearing when there is a small increase in pressure. In the recall of these elastic fiber fibers, blood is propelled along to muscular arteries. These types of arteries propel blood by the muscular tunica media. There are some types of differences in composition of types of arteries. The table here highlights some of those between muscular and elastic arteries. Pause and take a, have a read. Take a look and have a read. Remember that structural variations correlate to the differences in function that occur throughout the cardiovascular system. Veins and blood vessels shown here. Veins will show some structural changes when they increase in size but they're not as distinct as they are in the arteries. This picture shows the stylized circulatory route for blood flow. Take a read. The pulmonary circulation carries deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the alveoli, the air sacs, of the lungs and returns oxygenated blood from there to the left atrium. The pulmonary trunk emerges from the right ventricle and passes superiorly, posteriorly and to the left. It then divides into two branches, the right 
and left pulmonary arteries, to the right and left lungs respectively. The pulmonary arteries are the only arteries to carry deoxygenated blood after birth. On entering the lungs, the branches divide and subdivide until finally they form capillaries around the alveoli within the lungs, shown in this image. Carbon dioxide passes from the blood into the air sacs and is exhaled. Inhaled oxygen passes from the air within the lungs into the blood. The pulmonary capillaries unite to form venules and eventually pulmonary veins, which exit the lungs and carry the freshly oxygenated blood to the left atrium. Two left and two right pulmonary veins enter the left atrium. After birth, these veins are the only veins that carry oxygenated blood. Contraction of the left ventricle then ejects this blood into the systemic circulation. Here you can see number one, the heart, number two, the lungs, number three is the kidneys, number four, blood vessels to the large intestine, number five is the liver, number six, the veins, and number seven, the arteries. Circulation includes all the arteries and the arterioles that carry oxygen and nutrient-rich blood from the left ventricle to the systemic capillaries, plus all of the veins and venules that return the oxygen poor blood to the right atrium after flowing through the body organs. The principal arteries and veins of the systemic circulation are seen in these images. Of note is the aorta, the largest artery of the body, and the vena cava, the largest vein in the body. The aorta is the largest artery in the body and all systemic arteries branch from it. It is divided into four distinct divisions, ascending aorta, thoracic and abdominal aorta and the aortic art. The ascending aorta is the portion that emerges posteriorly to the pulmonary trunk from the left ventricle. It can be found behind the sternum at the level of the sternal angle. It gives off the left and right coronary arteries we learned about in the previous material. The right subclavian artery is a branch of the brachiocephalic trunk, the first branch of the arc of the aorta. The left subclavian artery arises directly from the aortic arc as the third branch. The subclavian arteries and their branches supply the brain structures in the neck, some of the thoracic wall and all of the upper limb, illustrated below. The axillary artery is a continuation of subclavian artery. It begins at the lateral edge of the first rib and ends at the lower border of the teres major muscle, shown in the image below. This is then called the brachial artery until it bifurcates at the anterior elbow region. The terminal branches of the brachial arteries are the ulna and radial arteries, which supply the forearm and hand. So an exercise for you is to use any resource to trace a drop of blood from the left ventricle to the radial artery at the upper limb, the right temporal artery, the middle cerebral arteries and the internal thoracic artery. Draw a flow chart to illustrate each pathway. After leaving the heart and descending through the thorax, the aorta crosses the diaphragm at the level of the 12th thoracic vertebrae and descends through the abdomen. 
At this level, it is known as the abdominal aorta. The abdominal aorta terminates at L4, where it bifurcates, divides into two, into the two common iliac arteries. There are a number of branches from the abdominal aorta that supply the abdominal organs, spine and posterior abdominal wall. These branches fall into one of three categories, anterior midline, lateral and posterior lateral. The major branches are summarized in the table below, giving the level at which they arise from vertebral column and the structures which they supplied blood to. The majority of the lower limb is supply, supplied by the femoral artery. This is a continuation of the external iliac. The external iliac becomes known as the femoral after it passes under the ingual ligament. After entering the thigh, the femoral artery will give a number of branches. One important branch is the deep femoral artery. This branch will give rise to the arteries which supply the thigh and the hip. The femoral artery will continue down the anterior medial aspect of the leg until it passes through a gap in the tenderness attachment of the adductor agnus, known as the adductor hiatus. The femoral artery will then appear on the posterior aspect of the carpal, known as the popliteal area, and will be known as the popliteal artery. The popliteal artery will travel down posterior to the knee. It will give off a number of branches to supply the knee or the carpal. The popliteal artery will then divide into the anterior and posterior tibial arteries. The anterior tibial artery will pierce the interosseous membrane and run down its anterior surface. It will become the dorsalis pedis artery on the dorsum of the foot. The posterior tibial, tibial artery will remain in the posterior compartment of the leg, ultimately dividing into the medial and lateral plantar arteries on the sole of the foot. Venous drainage anterior view, as you can see here, shows the systemic venous channels that are further classified as superficial veins, deep veins or venous sinuses. The superficial or cutaneous veins reside just beneath the surface of the skin. They channel blood from cutaneous tissues to deep veins via perforations in the deep fascia. Generally speaking, blood from the upper and lower limbs will be returned to the heart in deep veins. These accompany the major arteries, which we've already discussed. For example, the femoral artery will be accompanied by the femoral vein. The brachial artery will be accompanied by the brachial vein. However, in the distal portions of both the upper and lower limbs, deep veins accompany the arteries as venae comitantes. This refers to a vein that is usually paired with both veins lying on the sides of an artery. They're found in close proximity to arteries so that the pulsations of the artery aid venous flow, venous return. Because they are generally found in pairs, they are often referred to by their plural form. Venae comitantes are small paired veins which run on either side of the arteries. These can be seen distal to the elbow and knee in the upper and lower limbs, respectively. In the most distal portions of the limbs, these venae comitantes can divide into more numerous subdivisions, 
until they are more reminiscent of a plexus of veins wrapped around the arteries. Therefore, although deep veins are often drawn on diagrams, they are often not easy to distinguish within the limbs. However, this is a convenient arrangement as it allows blood to be propelled along the artery as a result of the pulsations within the artery. limbs will eventually form the two common iliac veins, which will unite to form the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava will course through the abdomen before opening into the right atrium of the heart. Veins from the upper limb will eventually form the two subclavian veins. These will unite with veins draining the head to form the brachiocephalic veins, which will in turn merge to form the superior vena cava, which will also feed into the right atrium of the heart. In addition to the deep veins which accompany major arteries, there is also a network of superficial veins which form the superficial venous system. These veins exist within the subcutaneous tissue and eventually drain into the deep veins. Although they often form a complex and highly variable network, there are a number of large veins which are more consistent and usually can be identified. For example, the great saphenous vein runs up the medial side of the leg and drains into the femoral vein. The small saphenous veins runs up the posterior aspect of the leg and drains in the, into the popliteal vein. Similarly, in the upper limb, the basilic and the cephalic vein run up the medial and lateral sides of the arm, respectively, draining into the brachial and axial veins, respectively. This all relates to the equine. Although we're showing you human diagrams, the purpose of this is to allow you to relate to it physically uh, and it's also easier to demonstrate, um, as most students will be more familiar with the human body. Blood which is supplied the brain exists in the cranial cavity via the internal jugular vein. This vein runs down through the neck in a fibrous sheath with a common carotid artery and vagus nerve at the base of the neck, it will merge with the subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic vein. As discussed previously, these will then merge to form the superior vena cava. Blood from the face, scalp and neck can drain via essentially one or two main veins, the internal and external jugular veins. The facial vein drains much of the face and it drains predominantly into the internal jugular vein. The superior temporal vein drains much of the scalp and joins with the maxillary vein to form the retromandibular vein. The retromandibular vein can be found within the substance of the parotid gland, one of the major sub salivary glands of the side of the face. It ultimately divides to give one branch destined for the internal jugular vein and another branch which will merge to form the external jugular vein. Most of the blood drained from the thorax is returned to the heart via the azygos system. On the right hand side of the body, the azygos vein ascends from the level of the diaphragm and drains into the superior vena cava or the caudal vena cava in the horse. On the left hand side of the thorax, the accessory hemozygos, upper thorax, and the hemozygos, lower thorax, drain blood from the left thoracic wall and cavity to the azygos for return to the heart. The Azygos system drains the back, thoracic wall and mediastinal viscera.
The majority of the blood in the body returns to the heart via the superior or inferior or caudal inferior vena cava. However, blood returning to the digestive tract flows to the liver for filtration before being returned to the heart in the inferior vena cava. This system is known as the portal vena system. Three main veins drain the organs of the digestive tract, the superior mesentric vein, the splenic vein, and the inferior mesentric vein. These veins unite to form the portal vein, which is a large vein that brings all the nutrient-rich bloods, poor bloods, to the liver. Blood is then filtered through the liver and returned to the heart via the inferior vena cava, or caudal vena cava. There are a number of locations within the body which are known as sites of portal caval or portal systemic. These are places which are at the limit of the territory for the portal system. Blood therefore can flow in veins that drain directly to the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava, or can drain through the veins destined for the liver. Pathology within the liver can lead to an increase in pressure within the portal venous system, known as portal hypertension. When this happens, blood can try to find an alternate route back to the heart. In this event, veins which are the, at the site of the portal, caval, anastomosis, can become enlarged, causing secondary symptoms in the patient. Three important sites of portal caval anastomosis are listed in the table below. The portal system is a system of blood vessels that begin and end in capillaries. Hepatic portal carries nutrients from digestion to the liver to store and metabolize after a meal. A study was taken to describe the normal venous pattern of the horse hoof, especially that associated with the dermal laminae of the wall. The characteristic and magnitude of these problems are not completely understood due to the lack of information about normal vascular system. For example, the decrease in the regional blood flow through the dermal laminae in laminitis is believed to be related to the redirection of blood through arterial venous shunts, although the existence of such shunts have not been proven. The medial and lateral proper digital veins drain all the venous blood from the hoof. Other veins of the hoof can be divided into two groups. Firstly, deep veins. Deep veins were those situated more inferior interiorly, which related directly to structures such as the distal phalanx. Distal sesamoid bone, hoof cartilage and digital cushion. B, superficial veins. Those are directly associated with the epidermis of the hoof, present within the dermis of the coronary bands, wall, sole, and frog of the foot. The vein that was close to the mid sagittal line was the axial vein. The more Peripherally located vein is the ab axial parallel vein. These veins drain the deep venous network of the distal phalanx within the semilunar canal. There are several anastomoses, which is a cross connection between adjacent channels, tubes, fibres, or other parts of a network between parallel veins.